The next four weeks, we're going to look at four emotions that are poisonous, that are toxic to our hearts. And when these emotions are exhibited, it's a big warning sign that's something wrong. And we're not just going to look at what's wrong. We're going to look at how to fix it. We're going to go through a heart detox, if you will, the next four weeks, where we're going to go on a journey together to make sure our hearts are in good shape. And my, my hope and my prayer is at the end of these next four weeks that whatever's going on in your heart, you can say it as well, that you can have peace knowing that your heart is in good shape. This morning, I get the fun one, anger. Oh, yeah. I hear that nervous little, uh, 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 oh, yep. Oh, no, I think it's fun. And it hit me how fun it was last Monday night. I'm laying in bed, and I'm studying up on this a little bit, and my wife's laying next to me half asleep, and then I realized, wait, I'm really getting to talk about anger. And I got very excited, turned over to her, and I say, like, babe, this week I'm preaching on anger. No, no response. And I'm like, Honey, you have given me such a wealth of examples that I can use for. <laughs> I tell you what, that woman came alive. She turned over, put her finger in my face and said, Chuck. No, she didn't even say Chuck. She said, Charles, if you use me as an example, I'm going to go on that stage Sunday morning and show them a real life example of what anger looks like. <laughs> so you're only going to get one story from her. I'm sorry. Don't get to delve into that wealth of knowledge. I can't get away with it like I did last service because she's in here. And giving me the eye. I see you, baby. Love you. But according to the Christian Counselors Association, nearly 50% of all their cases has an underlying root of anger. All right, you hear that? People go to these counselors for all sorts of things, whether it's marriage, depression, you fill in the blank. And they're telling us 50% of the time it has something to do when you start peeling away all the layers with anger. Anger is a big deal. It's a big deal in our society. It's a big deal as humans that we deal with this. I mean, it doesn't take you more than a few minutes on malfunction junction to realize what a problem anger is. I mean, we, uh, you know you've got a problem with anger when your kid starts yelling at the car in front of you before you start. I've experienced that. that. Talk about a gut check. All right. There's all sorts of different levels of anger, of course. And uh, whether it's big or small, if you're over six months to a year, you've dealt with some anger issues. I know I definitely did. I didn't realize that I had an anger problem until I got married. Not because of her, because of me. All right. Let me just make that clear. Because of me, not her. But we all deal with anger at some for it. And today, I'm not going to talk about just stubbing your toe and saying a few wordy dirds after that in the middle of the night. We're going to talk about, we're going to get real later, okay? We're going to get real, real when we look at this. And uh, the Bible talks a lot about anger. And Proverbs actually has quite a few things to say about it. So check this out, Proverbs 29, 22. Solomon writes, an angry person stirs up conflict and a hot-tempered person commits many sins. Now, you guys, as we read this, how many, just raise your hand, don't be embarrassed, how many of you guys thought of somebody, or there's always that lady in the neighborhood that's got a temper problem and dragging everybody in front of the almighty HOA board? I mean, we all experience this in life. Angry people can cause problems. They can be very uncomfortable to be around. It can be toxic to relationships. Anger causes trouble. In Proverbs 22, 24, Solomon also writes, Do not make friends with a hot-tempered person. Do not associate one with one easily angered. It causes problems. It causes problems with people, and it causes other repercussions. Tickets, um, a lot of broken items, and I mean a lot of broken items. How many, uh, don't raise your hand, but how many of us have lost multiple dishes from fights? How many of us have lost valuable electronics because of a fight? Because we got mad and we threw it. How many of us have put a hole in the wall or seen a hole put in the wall during a fight? Probably a lot of us. Anger can cause us all kinds of problems. It has a lot of negative effects. But have you ever stopped and thought, 
about why we're getting angry? You know, maybe there's something inside of us that's making us act that way. You know, maybe you're reacting big time over something small, and then you look back, and you're like, what in the world was I thinking? That was way overkill of a reaction. But when we get down to it, anger is a result of us not getting something. So check out what it says in James 4, 1 through 2. James writes here, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Do they come from the desires that battle within you? You desire, but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. You do not have because you don't ask God. So James is here making a case that we're getting angry because we're not getting what we want. The purest example of this is in young children. Now, I know none of your kids have ever done this, but just think about the last time you're going through Walmart or through Aldi or Publix or wherever you go, and uh, there was that kid. Uh, just, you just unfortunately had to be an innocent bystander on the same aisle, and they wanted whatever kind of cereal. They wanted whatever kind of candy. Mom says, no. Here it comes. Rolling on the floor, screaming, crying, hitting mom because they didn't get their Captain Crunch or whatever it may be. Purest example right there of a kid getting angry because they don't get what they want. Now, here's the thing. I would barter or I, I, would, I would wager that most of us in here, I'd say probably all of us in here don't do that anymore. And I really hope that's the case. It would be pretty strange if you're going to Walmart with your spouse and she says no, and uh, yeah, be really weird. We learn as adults to mask that. As kids, it's just raw emotion, raw energy. It's just flowing out, flowing out, flowing out. There's no control. But over time, we learn to control that. But sometimes, control, controlling it is different from dealing with it. Just because it's not being shown just because we're not acting out doesn't mean it's not there. Doesn't mean it's not making the way into our hearts. There's so many things that can leave us with anger. So many things. And again, I'm not trying to talk about the little stub in your toe moments. I want to get real with you guys today. There's a lot of things. You can lose a job. Okay? You want that job and you lost it. That can hurt you and make you angry. Or not getting a promotion you were promised. Or maybe somebody spreading rumors about you. How many of you guys want a good reputation? I think all of us want a great reputation. And if someone takes that from us by stealing rumors, that hurts us and it makes us angry. Or what if a spouse has an affair? Even a little more real. It hurts. And it also leaves us with anger. These things hurt us deeply because something is stolen from us. Something is taken from us that... Either we think we deserve it or because it really was owed to it, regardless if it's a real deal or not, to you, it is. And it leaves you hurt and it leaves you angry. This morning, I want to look at anger a little bit different, from a different angle. Probably most of you have never looked at it from this angle. But when you're angry, let's peel back all the layers. After you see the action, what was done Something was taken from you. You were robbed. And whenever you're robbed, someone owes you something. My wife's purse got stolen uh, about a year and a half ago. She was robbed. It left her without something. It made us angry. When something's taken, somebody owes you. That man owed her that purse back. That man owed her all that money that was back there. And let's just look at a few examples. Okay, I know this is probably a stretch, but every time there's an offense, something that makes us angry and hurt, something was taken away from us. Let's uh, look at something really, really simple. If you're um, late for dinner, guys, I used to be chronically bad at this. Okay? Many, many fights ensued because of my just being bad about being on time for dinner. Now, let's look at that. My wife would get mad. Okay, because I took something from her. 
She was innocent. I took something. What I took was the chance for good, quality family time. And probably more important, I took the chance to eat the meal when it was fresh off the stove. But I stole something from her. I owed her to be there on time. I owed her that family time. I'm in debt because I did not show up on time. Or what about if you were promised that job promotion? You went in and you put the extra hours in. Your boss said, dude, you're doing great. Keep rocking it. This promotion's yours. You're just, you're killing it, man. At the last moment, you give somebody else a job. That promotion was taken away from you. That your boss owed you that promotion. Thus, there is an offense. The action was not getting the job, that being taken away. But that was robbed from you. Your boss owes you. Or you have a friend that you just go and bear your heart to. You're going through a bunch of stuff and you open up about some very private things. That friend turns around and starts sharing that private stuff. Your friend, supposed friend, just robbed you of quite a few things. Maybe your reputation. They robbed you of your sense of privacy. They robbed you of your sense of trust that you had. They owed you that. You're mad because you didn't get what you wanted, because something was taken. And I'm not saying it's wrong that that upsets us. Something was taken. Or if a spouse leaves, they go off, have an affair, for whatever reason, leave. There's a lot that was robbed in that situation. The other spouse was robbed of their marriage. They were robbed of their intimacy. They were robbed of their security. Have every right to be mad. It was stolen from them. And not just the spouse, the kids. That parent who went off and left robbed those children of a normal family life. They robbed them of the opportunity to have the stable home with both parents that they wanted. There was an offense. And anger can take root in those things. Hurt and anger go together because something is stolen. You know, whatever causes the anger, there was a theft when you really get down to it. Regardless, you can hear me on this, regardless if it was justified or not, that's not the issue. Whether it's made up or real, not the issue. Anger comes because there's a perception that something was stolen. A little different angle here, but if you really think about it, almost anything, whether it's the peace of mind that was stolen, whether it was your self-confidence because of what somebody did, something was stolen. If you show me an angry person, I guarantee you that there's a story behind there. There's a story where they were hurt deeply. Whether it was something big or even something that we may think is silly, there was a serious hurt, a serious offense, something that was important to them was taken. And, and what happens when we get angry? We can either choose to deal with it, and we're going to talk about that in a few moments, or we internalize it or lash out. We deal with it, or we internalize or lash out. When we internalize it, and when we start lashing out, we allow that anger to start taking root in our heart, and it develops into something far more sinister than just anger or being mad at a moment. It develops into bitterness. Bitterness root, that root grows, and it takes root hardcore in your heart to where before it could have been taken out a little easier, you got to go to war to get that bitterness out. And as that bitterness stays in your heart, unfortunately what happens is it starts to change your demeanor. All of a sudden, you're not just mad at that person who did this to you. You start to become mad at the world. And people that had nothing to do with that original offense all of a sudden become innocent bystanders that get hit by your shrapnel when you're going off. All of a sudden, just getting mad for a few moments about somebody cutting you off in traffic becomes something that ruins your day because you're just so mad that somebody dared cut in front of you. Or your kid makes a simple mistake. Rather than dealing with them in love and whatnot and being mad for a few moments, you totally blow your cap and go way overboard. When we allow that bitterness and anger to take root, it changes our demeanor. And definitely, always for the negative. I want to ask you, do you have an anger problem? Don't raise your hand, but do you have an anger problem? 
Nobody's born angry. But something always happens. There's always that offense. There's always that hurt. There's always that pain where someone took something. Now they owe you. And it's there. Every angry person, whether they're showing it or not, has that story. That story, maybe it's something that they're hiding on to. Maybe it's a story that they use to justify their behavior. And, well, you'd understand why I act this way if such and such and such and such. There's a story. You know, some of us have got so good at internalizing it, we don't even realize that that's an issue. But remember, our emotions are the nervous systems of our heart. So when you see yourself snapping when you shouldn't, when you see yourself start having conversations in your head with some person over and over, and you're giving them the what for, or when there's somebody who you'd just be happy if they failed, chances are you might have an anger problem. Something may be deep in your heart. If while we're discussing this, you feel something stirring in your heart, maybe even a little uncomfort, there may be some anger in there that you weren't even aware that's there. I want to encourage you, if you're suspicious that maybe you have an issue, or maybe you're just not sure, ask somebody. And if you're going to ask the question, and it just feels awkward, and it feels uncomfortable, you might have something deep down in there. Or if, if while uh, you go to ask somebody, and that person is scared, chances are you've got an anger problem. Just saying. Or if um, when you ask somebody, they're just tiptoeing on thin ice and walking around the eggshells and they're like choosing their words super carefully, chances are you got an anger problem. Or if while they're trying to explain your issue to you, you keep interrupting them and say, but, 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 and explain yourself, or you get the urge just to walk out and run away from the conversation, chances are you got a little anger. Now, here's the thing. I'm not going to sit up here and point fingers because guess what? I've got problems. And I thank God that he's helped me with these as well. There's nobody here judging. The fact of the matter is there's people in here that have been hurt deeply. And now let's, let's focus on what's more important. Let's admit we've got a problem, and now let's fix it. Amen? Anger and pain, they're enemies of our heart absolute enemies. Let's bring it out into the light. Enemies of our heart don't like to be brought out into the light. They like to be hidden deep in our hearts. They like where they're at, but let's bring it out. Whether you have a story that you've never told anybody, or maybe it's one of those stories that you used to justify, I encourage you, open up and share with that. Let the healing start to take place. Are you ready? Are you ready to stop letting anger take control of you? How dumb is it that we let somebody that hurt us years ago still control our lives today? I get it. It's hard. But when we let that anger sit there, when we let it fester, you're allowing it to control your life today. Let's get free. Let's get free. Let's look at what God's Word says about this. Let's check out Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31. Paul writes here, Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Do you guys see that? Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, and he goes on. All right, now he, here's what's great about these word choice. He says, get rid of. Now the connotation here, it's not like when you have a moment, go ahead and start dealing with it. Get rid of speaks up immediately do something, like a criminal with evidence. Get rid of it. Or, if you have one of those cockroaches crawl up on your leg, don't sit here and tell me you're just going to look at it and like, well, I might want to knock that guy off eventually. Most of you guys are going to be jumping up, screaming, whacking that thing off. That's what he's talking about here. Get rid of it immediately and fast. Shake it off. And you're wondering, okay, cool, I get it, I'm on board. But how do we do that? In the next verse, he tells us, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ, God, forgave 
you. You guys catch that? Just as God forgave you. And you're probably thinking, how can I be kind and compassionate to this person who's hurt me so deeply? How can I be kind and compassionate? You don't, Paul doesn't know the kind of weight I'm dragging. Paul doesn't know what's happened to me. Let me tell you something about Paul. This guy was beaten and left for dead. When he's writing this, he's in prison unjustly in this nasty prison in Rome, and he's about to go on a sham trial and be put to death. I think Paul knows a little bit about being hurt. I think he knows a little bit about something being taken from him. But he understands something, that if he were to let that bitterness take root in his heart, it's going to mess him up. It's going to mess him up badly. So he says, you know what? We can forgive as God forgave us. See, Paul is a man who experienced that forgiveness. He used to kill Christians. He used to go on a war path against them. But God showed up, changed this guy's life. He experienced that forgiveness. He understood the power of what forgiveness can do. He's sitting in that prison and has complete peace with God because he understood the power of forgiveness. Jesus spoke a whole lot about forgiveness as well. That's kind of the whole reason he came, so that he can forgive us of our sins, so that we can have right standing with God. See, before Jesus came, the law was basically an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. If things were going to be made right, it had to be an equal payment. Jesus comes on the scene, shatters that idea, a whole new way of looking for stuff. It was probably offensive to a lot of the people at the time. that I was actually supposed to forgive, not get even. It was a new concept. And as he taught this, you can just imagine how people had to work through that. Totally new way of thinking. And uh, there's this verse where we're going we're to analyze this passage in a second where Peter comes up to Jesus. And he's thinking, you know what? I think I'm starting to get this forgiveness thing. I'm supposed to freely forgive because Jesus is coming so that we can be forgiven. So yeah, I can offer some forgiveness. And he's working through, well, what does that look like? Are there boundaries? Is there too much? Not enough? So he goes up to Jesus. We're going to look at Matthew 18. I'm going to start in verse 21. It says, Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. And another verse that says 70 times seven, 490 times. See, Jesus is making a big, a big comparison here. Peter thought he's doing pretty good. And Jesus said, you don't quite get it yet, Peter. You don't quite get it. You've got to freely forgive. There's no boundaries. You've got to forgive. And Jesus wanted to make sure that Peter understood this. And he tells the following story. I'm going to pick it back up in verse 23. It says, Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold you got that? 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that they had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him and canceled the debt. And let him go. See, here's what's interesting about the story. Obviously, you guys follow along. There's a servant that owes the king a lot of money. According to the commentaries that I've read on this, back then, 10,000 bags of gold would have been literally impossible for this servant to repay. Literally impossible. If he would have sold everything he had, wife, kids, and everything, and worked every day of his life, he would have never been able to repay this debt. He knew that, and the king knew that. Never could he repay that debt. He was completely powerless. Completely powerless and in debt to this king. But what's cool here is that the king knows that he can't repay the debt. He could have said, okay, man, I hear you begging. Go ahead and just pay back what you can. But the king, in great compassion, in great mercy cancels the debt. That's a big deal. Now, I don't know about you, 
But if my mortgage company, if I got a letter in the mail saying, you know what, we just want to know that we appreciate you as a customer, the rest of it's been paid in full. Hello, somebody. I don't know about you, but I'd have a spring in my step, and I'd feel extra generous that week. You know what I'm saying? Now, do you think that's what this guy did? Some of you guys know the story. You know what's about to happen. Let's check this out. And verse 28, but when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Come on. That, that's uh, not what we expected, is it? And he says, pay back what you owe me. The, his fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. Not at all what we'd expect to see. Not at all seeing this dude who's just been forgiven an amount he would never, ever be able to repay, choking this dude out and demanding his money. Here's the thing. The silver coins, a hundred of them, it's very possible that this guy could have come up with the money in a week or two. Okay, It's not that big of a sum of money. Now, okay, cool. Maybe he could have just given him those cool couple weeks. I don't know the situation that he was in. Maybe he really needed some money to feed a family that week. I, I really don't know. But what we do know is his reaction is not exactly what we'd expect. So maybe he's going to give the guy some time. Maybe not. Let's see. In verse 30, it continues. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could repay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Wow. Now, if you're with me here, that's a pretty big contrast to how he was handled and how he treated others. Huge contrast. I mean, I don't know what's up with this guy. Now, you got to understand something. Just because the one servant's debt was canceled doesn't mean this other guy was canceled, okay? Just because he was forgiven doesn't mean this guy who owed him automatically was either. That guy still owed him. But what's so mind-blowing here is not the fact that there's still a debt right here. What's mind-blowing is how the one servant was treated with such grace, with such compassion, and then a guy who owes him diddly squat compared to what he was forgiven, he treats to the fullest extent of the law as harshly as he could. I don't know about you, but that's just, I think that's messed up. Even though he had a right to that debt, he also was indebted to the king and had been forgiven. He should have showed compassion as well. And the story continues. Then the master called the servant in, said, you wicked servant, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servants just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brothers or sisters from your heart. This is where it gets real, guys. Jesus is making a very strong point. Very, very strong point. You and I have a debt to God that we can never repay. We could do all the good works that we wanted. We can do anything. We could work 24-7, 365, but we can never repay that debt that we owe to God. But you know what? God's like that king who said, regardless of how much you owe me, I'm going to extend grace. You're forgiven. Your debt to me is canceled. God showed us so much grace and mercy when he sent Jesus to forgive us of that debt. And what does Jesus say right here? We're to forgive others as well. Just as God in Christ Jesus has forgiven us, we're to forgive others. We can never repay God for all that he's done for us, for all the mishaps that we've done, for all of our sins. We don't have to, because he's canceled the debt. Now, just as he's done that for us, now we've got to walk that out. Get this, guys. Forgiveness, it's not an event. It's not a one-time thing where you just say it and wave it off. 
Forgiveness, it's a process. It's something that we have to work on, that we've got to work through. It's not easy. There's some people in here that, you know what, they want to forgive, but they just can't. There's others who have tried to forgive, but it just doesn't seem to stick. And others, they don't even know where to start to forgive. The pain's that deep. The pain's that real. Maybe there's bitterness that's clawing in your heart so deeply, you don't think you can shake it off. Forgiveness isn't an event. It's not a quick, easy fix. It's a process. If you guys want to experience peace and freedom from that, forgiveness is what's going to give you that freedom. It's forgiveness. Now, I want to make a point here. To forgive is not to forget. We're humans, okay? Just because we forgive doesn't mean that we're going to forget. But we've got to keep working at it and continue every day to make that choice. So I want to give you four points. This will get you started on the process to forgive. The first thing you've got to do, and this sounds very simplistic, but hang with me, is you've got to identify who you're angry with. There's people who've been hurt deeply in the past, and by multiple people, so much, and they've buried it and buried it and buried it, that they don't even know why they're angry. They snap, they explode, they know they've got some anger issues going on, but they don't even know why anymore. Don't go through this step too fast. Identify who you're angry with. And if it's more than one people and it starts to become a long list, start writing it down. Okay? Make a list. Who are you angry with? And ask, here's some stuff to ask yourself. Who do I never want to see again? There's some names that will come in your head when you start asking that. Who do I never want to see again? Who are you having those angry imaginary conversations in your head with? Put the name down. Who would you like to be paid back from? Write the name down. Who, if they failed, it wouldn't upset you in the least? Write the name down. What kind of relationships did you have with people that may have hurt you? Whether it's exes, a spouse, family members, coaches, teachers, coworkers, friends, you go down the list. Make a list of who it is that you're angry with, who it is that hurt you. Now, the second step, we get a little bit more complicated here. Determine what they owe you. Just like that story that we looked at, the king forgave a very specific amount. He gave, forgave 10,000 bags of gold. When you go to forgive somebody, you need to name exactly what it is that you're forgiving. Be very specific. Ask yourself, what would it take from them to make it right? Now, often, the thing that it would take to make it right, it's impossible. You can't get it, okay? It doesn't matter if you can get it or not, write it down. Maybe you had a parent who didn't show up to your games, and there was anger that was formed years and years ago that's still there. Can they ever make that up? That time's gone. Maybe it's somebody who's already deceased. Can they make it up to you? Can they repay you? No, but that's okay. Be specific about what was taken from you, not what was done to you. Okay, hear me on this. Separate two, not what was done. But as a result of that action, what was taken from you? Was it your pride? Was it your dignity? Was it a marriage? Was it time? Was it money? Whatever it is, be specific about what it was. Next, here's the hard part. Cancel the debt. Get rid of it. Cancel it. They don't owe you anymore. Just like Christ forgave us. We need to do the same. We need to freely forgive. Now, hear me on this. This isn't something that you're just gifting them with. It's between you and God. This is a transaction that you're going to make out of your own free will, from your heart, from your mind, where you're choosing consciously, I'm going to forgive you for this. You don't owe me this anymore. You say, but they owe me all this time. They owe me this memory. They owe me the peace of mind that they robbed me for 20 years. You say, you don't owe me anymore. You say that in your heart. You say that with your mouth. You don't owe me anymore. 
you know, for many things, just making that statement, it's enough. You make that statement that you don't owe me anymore. But for other things, it's deeply rooted. It takes a little more to really, out of your will, choose to forgive that debt. I've heard stories where people will sit around a table, an empty table, and they'll take a chair and designate it and talk to that chair as if that person was sitting there. And they'll talk about what happened. They'll talk about what was robbed. At the end of that conversation, say, so-and-so, I forgive you. You don't owe me anymore. Your debt is canceled. Or maybe you write it out. Put it on paper. Put the name. Put the offense. What they owed you. Take it in your hand. And symbolically, you don't owe me anymore. Burn that piece of paper. Bury that piece of paper. Go take it to a cross and nail it to it. Do something to symbolize that you are getting rid of that debt. They don't owe you anymore. And on this note, get in the habit of doing this regularly to immediately cancel the debt. Because once you're free from anger, you don't want to go back. You don't want to go back. You want to enjoy that freedom. So get in the habit of immediately canceling the debt. Say something very simple. When you feel that anger coming on, when somebody takes something from you, you say, God, right now, right here, I'm choosing to forgive this person because they stole this from me. God, I'm choosing out of my own free will to say this debt is forgiven. So and so, you owe me nothing. Jesus, thank you that you're helping me to forgive them. Get in the habit of doing that regularly and often. Stay free from the bondage of anger. Stay free by doing that. Number four, this is where the longevity of forgiveness happens. And number four, and it's to dismiss the case. You've canceled it, you've forgiven it, but now you've got to keep the case closed. Just as I said a few moments ago, forgiveness doesn't equal forgetting all the time. Somebody will say something that will make you remember that event. You'll see something that will trigger that memory. Maybe it comes to you in a dream. Something will happen to trigger that memory. When that happens, it's okay that you feel those emotions. Your forgiveness is not based on how you feel. You guys hear me? It's not based on how you feel. You made a choice. You said, I choose to forgive. I choose that this debt is canceled. It's not based on your emotions. We're human. We're going to deal with that. But as we continue to say, when those emotions come, this person owes me nothing. I've forgiven them. And when we do that over time, the emotions will fade. The memories will become less painful. We'll be able to view that person and how like God views them. Sometimes it's going to take time. But this is where you've got to be consistent. Whenever those emotions come back, this person doesn't owe me any more. When you discover, when you discover, when you experience the power of forgiveness, you're going to run to it. You're going to embrace it because you don't ever want to be shackled by the anger again. And I want to encourage you right now. I know there's people, there's many of us who have these deep pains. Many of us have to deal with this anger controlling our lives. Get free of it. Get free of it this morning. Make the choice, your choice, to forgive them. I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but I'm telling you, peace and freedom is found in forgiveness. Last year, we saw one of the most horrific events in our state's history happen. When a young man walked inside a church and killed nine people, Very painful for our whole state, for our country, but even more so for the families. They were robbed of their family members. I'm sure every single one of us can remember where we were when we heard the news. We can remember the aftermath. But you know what sticks out more than anything else in that? Is how those families chose to immediately forgive. You see, they experienced the power of God's forgiveness in their life. I want to just show a clip of that real fast. I forgive you. You took something very precious away from me. 
I would never talk to her ever again. I would never be able to hold her again. But I forgive you. You know, I forgive you, my family forgive you. But we would like you to take this opportunity to repent. Repent. Confess. Give your life to the one who matters the most, Christ. We welcome you Wednesday night in our Bible study with open arms. You have killed some of the most beautiful people that I know. Every fiber in my body hurts, but as we say in a Bible study, we enjoyed you, but may God have mercy on you. Wow. How could somebody, after something so painful, something so horrific as that, walk into a courtroom and say that? That's the power of forgiveness, guys. Were they hurting? You bet. As the first lady said, with every fiber of her being. But they'd experienced something more powerful than what was done that day. They experienced the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. This clip and the other clips like it have been viewed millions of times on YouTube. I remember right after this happened, news anchors just bawling on air as they reported on this. They said no to bitterness. They said no to anger, but yes to forgiveness. And I can't come up here and tell you that I'd be able to do the same thing. I watch that and I wonder, God, would I have the strength to be able to do that? What a powerful, powerful example of forgiveness. I want to ask you to stand with me as we ready to close out this morning. I don't know your stories, but I do know if you're still living and you're still breathing, you've been hurt before. The question is, have you been able to deal with that? Or has it been something you've held on to? I want to invite you this morning to let go, to embrace the freedom. Freedom from the anger. Freedom from anger is found in the embrace of forgiveness. Embrace it this morning, guys. If you're in here and you haven't experienced the forgiveness that comes from Jesus, if you haven't accepted him into your life, let me tell you, that's where to start. Before you even move on to the four steps that we talked about, you need to experience the forgiveness of Jesus from that debt that you could never pay. I want to ask everybody to close their eyes briefly. No matter what you've gone through, no matter what's happened, no matter what you've done, God loves you. Jesus loves you. And he's ready to extend that offer of forgiveness to you right now. That's the first step of forgiveness, is to accept his forgiveness.